Hey, welcome back. We're continuing down our journey in Unit 5 on political participation. We're almost done. Um, our next sections go pretty quickly. Uh, this is 5.9, Congressional Elections. It's not going to be super different from the one we just learned on presidential elections. So hold on. We got this. Okay, so this is just a map from the BP BBC. Um, and we're going to talk about how the elections for Congress run. Now, congressional elections still have basically the same stages that we learned about for presidential elections. If you don't remember, go back and, and or at least check your notes. And, and what are those stages? So remember the exploratory, they might not make a book that goes, right? Some do, um, but intra-party elections, right? There's still like, um, they still have to figure out like which Republican do we want to represent us? Which Democrat do we want to represent us? Um, there's still debates. They're usually not as, um, you know, they might not be nationally televised, though some are because some congressional elections get a lot of media attention. And of course, there's still that election at the end. Now, incumbent behavior, just like it helps the president get reelected, it's going to also help senators and Congress people get reelected. As you see on the left, incumbent rates for reelection are pretty darn high, right? Um, a lot of people, you know, will advocate term limits. Well, people keep reelecting people in, right? So they always can not do it, but, but incumbents have an advantage as to why they do get reelected. And I just want to show you some names here. You may have noticed that, um, Don Young of Alaska. He passed away very recently, about maybe like a month ago, um, and he lied in, in state. Um, on the bottom here, we have Dingle. He served for 59 years and like 21 days. Um, when he stepped down, he didn't die in office. I'll double check, but I'm pretty darn sure. His wife, I believe, took his seat, which is more common than not. There's a whole other theory out there that uh, Americans tend to vote in relatives. Think think of the Bushes, the Kennedys, um, because we still long to have a monarchy or, an, or, you know, that's a whole other story, but something to think about. Maybe we can talk about that after the exam. Anyway, um, why do incumbents have these advantages? Same things. They have, for one, they spend lots of time fundraising. If you're in, uh, you know, in the legislative branch, you spend most of your day on the phone making calls. Who's giving me money, right? They also have this thing called franking privilege where people in office have the free use of the postal service. So they can send out like, hey, look what bill I helped pass. So, hey, look what I helped vote for. You know, of course, with things like social media, right? My local uh, congressman just like posted about a, a bill he helped pass through keep lakes clean, right? That didn't cost anything, but he, he is, he can send that home and through the mail too, if he wants. All right. Um, then we have the state elections. Um, sometimes there's not even people running against them. If it's like a safe seat or a safe district, um, at least in the primary zone. And sometimes you usually still have someone run against you of the opposite party, but obviously it's like a no-name person. And if you're you're recognized, you have such an advantage. Linkage institutions still play a role here. Different groups still donate money, still advertise, still speak on behalf, still campaign for, still knock on doors for all these things. Um, and they really help with congressional incumbent reelections. Um, but there's more, um, in the house, right? But this the Senate has like a longer term, almost like sort of six years to mess up, I guess, but the rates are still over 80%, um, very, very high. So you can see this also I want to point out, this is no longer accurate because young did pass away. Um, but you see some of the other longest running people who are still there in office. You better recognize Nancy Pelosi's name and Steny Hoyer's name, right, at this point. Um, so I wanted to show you here just a little bit. Um, safe seats, there are not as many safe seats um, just because as the 
politicalization, or I should say, there's not as many swing as the political polarization happens. Um, they tend to go to more one way or the other. Um, they get outside donors. How the media covers these elections all makes a difference. So, like I said, some House elections are getting national attention now. Um, you best believe when Marjorie Taylor Greene goes up for re-election, they're going to put a lot on the news that night, right? Uh, you know, some people just get more attention than others. Um, also campaign finance, right? The money they get and also gerrymandering, right? That plays a role. So how sh things are divided up. All right. So, um, the length, uh, of this, of their terms, often, uh, you're going to find career politicians. So like all these people, they're basically career politicians. The idea was that these people were going to go home and have their other jobs and that would make them more relatable to the people. Not so much what goes on today. All right. So like I said, that was quick. If you feel like any of this is too quick, go watch the AP versions. But like I, a lot of this is repetitive and similar to what we did with the presidential elections. Now, what about campaigns? How are modern campaigns run? Um, and this is sort of what I was alluding to before. There's less common ground now between Republicans and Democrats. Now, people will still say, oh, they're all the same. There's no difference. Yeah, there's some truth to that. But there used to be more of a commonality, more of shared agreement between the left and the right. And over the most recent decades, that has changed. There's a couple of reasons for that. But the polarization means there's less common grounds, less bipartisan things. We saw the way the vote was for Judge Katanji Brown Jackson, right? There was not much crossover there. And polarization has really increased since the 1940s. Think like post-World War II era. Um, and because of this, most candidates are now announcing their candidacy a good 18 months before the election. This is the same country that they used to not even campaign because they thought it was ungentlemanlike. But now we're like hyper campaigning, right? So the midterm elections are going to be in November. So how many months away is that? If now is April, seven months. So you know that the campaign is already into effect. You might not see it much uh, until it gets closer, um, but this goes. And we also stated, um, keep in mind that if, a, if, the, if Congress and the president are the same party, midterm elections Congress tends to flip. So right now, because we have a Democratic president and a Democratic Congress, history shows us that the Congress will flip to a Republican. Now, keep in mind, the Democratic majority is small. It's all, You almost can't even call it a majority. It's almost break even. Well, does that mean it might be less, of, less likely that it flips? Oh, stay tuned. Come see me in the hallways next year. Send me a comment. We'll, we'll discuss. All right. So this, anyway, this polarization, this hyper competitive nature is why these campaigns start to get drawn out and start way before. Okay. Another feature is because people are often voting for a person now instead of a party, the cult of personality. Um, they, they vote really because they want a certain candidate. Okay. Especially if that candidate isn't what they consider an outsider. We don't like what's going on in politics. We want someone who's not part of that. That was a big part of Trump's appeal to, to people that he appealed to. Right. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, the, Mago the, um, what else contributes to this? Um, parties get sort of lost because of this, because like, oh, we're, they're trying to keep up with the candidates. Um, we keep talking about the McGovern Fraser commission that tried to democratize the nomination, but people still sort of want a little bit of that outsider. Um, but the party is the one that has the money. So often the outsiders are people who also have money. All right. But um, parties have important things that candidates want. So it's not like they can just distance themselves from them completely. Right. 
Um, one of the big questions in the debate was if the Republican Party chooses not to to choose you, would Trump run on his own? Well, he wanted the Republican Party to choose him, even though he used to be a Democrat. Do we even talk about that? That's another story. But why? Um, because the parties have the data, right? They know all this information that is helpful. Parties have the past knowledge or the elections. They coordinate the policy agenda. They have all the volunteers to answer the phones and knock on the doors and send out the mailers. They're the one that holds the nominations. So as much as there's a distance, it's really hard for them to have a big break. All right. Now, what do these campaigns need? These campaigns need money. Money. So we're going to go into campaign finance. So once again, I'm looking at the big picture ideas here. If you want more detail, you know where to find it. We can discuss it. Okay. Why do you need money for elections? Right. For lots of reasons. We have now spent a lot more money on campaigning than we did just decades. Forget before, say, the 1900s. But as over time, the electorate has also enlarged. If you're only appealing to white male property owners back in the day, that's a lot less money, a lot less time and effort. But as voting rights have expanded and the populace and the electorate has expanded, you now need more resources to try to get that vote from people. All right. So more votes involve more money. Now there's been party reforms. All right. Um, for example, once again, the McGovern Finance Commission, right? We're trying to bring votes in. We want votes. And usually when a, uh, people fight for voters to become eligible, it's because they think the voters will vote for them. The party that thought women were going to vote for them wanted women to vote. Right? It makes sense. And you can apply that to other demographics as well. There's also been changes with um, communication and technology. That makes a difference as well. Right? Now people can put ads on Facebook. Uh, and it's not just print ads. Right? It's TV all those things. So there's been some trends. Um, and what we're going to see here is a, a few different acts. You do not need to remember the details of all these acts. If you're like, uh, if you're taking notes, don't go crazy. What you want to see is the overarching theme. Okay. Maybe a push requires you to memorize all that. I don't think so though, even. All right. So let's start with before the 1900s, we have the Pendleton act. All right. And basically this is getting rid of the spoils system. You can't just put someone in office because they gave a lot of money to your campaign. Does that still happen? Maybe it's not supposed to. You need, you're going to get this job based on merit. Then we have the Tillman act of, um, 1907. This came about because of the way TR, um, was getting funded from some really big corporations. And I got this from, Ooh, I wanted to write it down. I don't want to like be plagiarizing. Mm, I think it's uh, double check. I'll, I'll write it in the notes later. Um, but this banned certain corporate and bank donations. All right. You can pause it if you want to read through this. Next, we have the federal corrupt practices act of 1910. This came from, I put it in, this came from Cambridge University Press. So once again, you can pause it. Maybe just read the top paragraph, right? But this means you have to like disclose certain information, right? Every donation of $100 or more, blah, blah, blah. You had now had to report it, all right? So how does all this campaign finance, how does it affect things like, you know, the candidate and the party? That's the things you want to keep in mind. So we have things called hard money, soft money, and there's also something else called dark money, All right? So this article on the left is actually sort of older. This is from the nineties, but it shows you how this has been a big concern for a while now. And then this article from Politico, right? About 
you always see people trying to make some crackdowns. And usually you're going to try to crack down on people if they're the opposite party of you, right? All right. So the candidates, hard money is money they're spending on this campaign. Think of all the things you need to spend on if you're campaigning. You're flying out someplace, you need the ticket. What are you going to wear? All right. That's part of your campaign funds. You got to eat when you're there. That's part of your campaign funds. But also you have all the other things that go with campaigning, like the actual ads and things, right? They try to put a cap on this, um, individual groups, right? How much can a group donate? How much can an individual donate? What about PACs? Well, when you donate money, that's fine, but you got to disclose it to the FEC, the federal, right? The elections people, I need to know this. And that's going to be published and you can go online and see who's donating to what candidates and how much you want to know where the, the, the money trail, they have to disclose the amount and the donor and there's caps on it. And you have some political action committees and they pull money from corporations, from unions from trade associations or even uh, members who engage in elect electioneering communications, All right? So political action committees, I think there was a vocab word. We next have the federal election campaign act from your friends at Britannica. All right. They also put caps on donations. Look at this is 71. So then once again, just a little bit after, the McCain Feingold, they're trying, I'm um, sorry, McGovern Frazier, they're trying to democratize things. All right. There's the disclosure amount there. Now, soft money is a little bit different. It's a bit more vague. It's money that's going to a party building activity. What is a party building activity? Will you tell me? All right. It could be a lot of different things. All right. Um, and this, uh, is a reference to the, some of these, like how people will try to like check, right? Right now, this is from just a few weeks ago, ABC news. It's good to know the source. They're saying that Trump is accused of breaking campaign laws by teasing a 2024 run. Now, you know, he's already still out having these rallies, but a pro democratic pack is saying that he's already breaking uh, laws by spending money for other another run in the White House, but he hasn't filed for his candidacy to see yet. All right, stay tuned. We'll see what happens. Okay, we have um, the bipartisan campaign reform act. You see right there, that is um, also known as the McCain-Feingold. We've talked about that a lot. Soft money can end up being, you know, what is a party building activity? It could be things like voter registration drives, yard signs, all sorts of things. Uh, and lastly, we have dark money. Um, and I thought I had a slide for this. Um, let's go back to Citizens United, right? This is a good time to review that case. Go through your notes, go check it. Do you remember what Citizens United is? They did protect um, certain rights of corporations or unions, but they concluded that spending money on politicals is, is, is a type of free speech. So all these laws have a little bit of murkiness and are subject to some interpretation. And that's why they're in the court so much. And that's why you see so many news stories so much. All right, we're gonna finish up with um, some things on the media and the changing media when it comes to these campaigns. Um, if any of this stuff was confusing, you can go back, write down, ask me questions, check um, the other resources as well, right? But as long as you get the big picture, I think you're good to go. All right, stay tuned guys, we're almost there.